recording. And I'm letting everybody in. Good afternoon. I'm just going to let more people come in. See some committee members coming in right now. Anne Marie, Phil. Good to have you guys. Scott from the airport. Just five more seconds. Clayton, thanks for coming. Another Pulse board member. Muhammad, I miss seeing you, man. All right, well, we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome, my name is Sarah Pearson. I am the Executive Vice President with the Boca Chamber and welcome to our Pulse Committee panel, or our Pulse panel uh, for August. And I love the top title, uh, From Commuter to Couch Potato which I have to give Jamie credit. I don't know if she's on this call yet, but Jamie's the one who came up with that after a very long day of working from home on her couch. She came up with that really cool title. So um, it will be a very interesting topic. We have three great speakers today, um, definitely covering everything that, that needs to be covered from mental, physical, emotional uh, in, in, in this state that we're in right now. So. I'm going to ask Chastity to say a few words real quick on housekeeping and how to ask questions and all that fun stuff. Ms. Chastity. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our virtual Pulse presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later on today. So if you want to check it out, you want to share it with your friends and colleagues, be sure to go to our YouTube channel and share that content. Uh, for questions, we'll be doing Q&A in the Q&A box. So if you hover down at the bottom of your Zoom menu, you will see two little bubbles that say Q&A. You can put in all of your questions in there. It will go out to um, everyone. If you want to make it anonymously, you can click on that little anonymous uh, button or uh, check menu, and then you'll be able to send your question anonymously. So enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you very, very much. All right, now I'd like to ask Jordan Sherwood. Jordan is uh, the incoming chair of the Pulse Committee, so he will be leading this committee next year, uh, next fiscal year, which starts November 1st, to say a few words about Pulse itself. Jordan, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Sarah, and thank you so much for, uh, you know, all my fellow committee members for being here today, uh, as well as, uh, you know, everybody either that's been at a previous Pulse event or is new. I'm excited for today's program. I think we're going to have some some excellent takeaways. And uh, for those that are new, so the Boca Chamber, you know, back in 2003, uh, started the Pulse Division. It was, you know, uh, an opportunity for some of the younger professionals in our community, 20 and 30 year olds, uh, to, to have events, be able to network with each other, um, receive valuable information from speakers like today, uh, and grow and, and grow their brand, grow, grow within the community. So uh, while we've had to pivot a little bit on some of those in-person events and now these virtual events, uh, we're, st we're still trying to come up with, you know, unique opportunities and, and, and things to attend. So um, definitely encourage you to continue to attend these Pulse events. Uh, tell your friends, tell your, your, your coworkers, tell your colleagues uh, to, to be a part of this community because it's such an integral part. Uh, of what the Boca Raton Chamber of Commerce uh, and we are trying to do uh, as a Pulse group. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Sarah, and I'll throw it back to you for uh, the start of today's pro program. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Jordan. And, and I do agree. I mean, our Pulse program is geared to enable those of you uh, professionals under 40 uh, to be around like-minded professionals like yourself to, you know, a lot of, a lot of the same challenges are happening. Uh, that you might be feeling or have happening with potential, you know, colleagues, customers, uh, or friends that you can meet in uh, through the Pulse Committee, so or the Pulse Group. So we have after-hours events. We have quarterly luncheons, which are not luncheons anymore. Now they're virtual, uh, but we have great speakers, and it's very much geared toward the professional under 40. So tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your cousins and we'll keep it going. All right, so 
the program. So we again, I had said we have three great speakers. Uh, I am not going to read their bios. I'm going to ask that they introduce themselves. But I can tell you that the committee chose very uh, specifically these speakers to cover different topics. So our first would be Dr. Cooper, Dr. Bell Cooper. She is with Lynn University, and what she's going to be talking about and what her expertise are is you know how to lead your team. If you if you um, if you are a manager or just have a group of people that you work with, right now, morale might be down. There's a lot of uh, no interaction happening, uh, social interaction uh, that's not virtual. So, you know, how do you keep your team engaged? How do you lead them? How do they keep the morale up? So, um, Dr. Cooper will be talking about that. Dr. Cooper, do you want to just share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I, I can't see all of your faces, but I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm a professor of business analytics at Lynn University, and I'm a statistical consultant at the consulting firm Stevens Strategy. Um, so as a faculty member at Lynn, I've been able to do a lot of research. Um, my research is focused on personality and social psychology. So I really examine how our psychology impacts us in our daily lives, in our careers, and our relationships. And then I look at the reverse too, so how our careers, our lives, and our relationships affect our psychology. Um, my most recent scientific publications look at um, how our personalities are shown through our social media profiles. We can tell a lot about a person just by looking at their social media accounts. Um, and I'm also finishing up a study with my colleague, Dr. Rachel Pauletti, that looks at how different types of people are coping with this pandemic. So I'm excited to share all the cool things we've been able to find from that study in this webinar. Um, but really, my responses today will focus on the psychological research that we can apply to our workplace, our relationships, and our everyday lives. So thanks so much for having me here. Thank you. And that'll be, uh, we'll, we'll have a whole nother webinar on uh, social media and that would be very interesting. So thank you very much. All right, and so our next speaker uh, will be Julie Cantor, uh, founder of Two Mentor. And a, a big reason why this group was created was to allow professionals under 40 the ability to meet maybe more seasoned professionals, the C-level executives of the corporate headquarters and, and people like that that are already and also engaged in our chamber to um, maybe create mentorship opportunities. Uh, and so we thought it was very appropriate to bring Julie on to, as a panelist today to talk about how we can still grow and build those relationships in the time of quarantine. So Julie. Thank you, Sarah, and great to be here with you all. And um, yeah, I um, moved to Boca Raton um, two years ago from Washington, DC and love it here. Um, living in East Boca and building in West Boca right now, a house. And um, I live here with my daughter and husband and 10 pound Havanese, Naomi. Um, I'm extremely passionate. Everything I do really comes back to how does one human being help another and create meaningful connections. So um, I have worked since starting my business um, five years ago. Um, I have worked with New York University, um, Next Era Energy, Anthem Insurance, the Federal Reserve Bank, standing up corporate and organizational mentoring initiatives so that people are better engaged and retained and we drive more diversity and we elevate women in the workplace. Um, so I'm excited to kind of bring some thoughts on the benefits of having a mentor, the benefits of being a mentor, and how you flex that muscle, and why there's been no better time than now to create mentoring relationships with people um, that you wanna learn from and that can learn from you. So delighted to be here, thanks Sarah. Thank you, thank you, happy to have you here. And our third panelist, and, and it's funny because our third panelist, whether you're a professional under 40 or not, 
you know, certainly is, is valuable when it comes to our aching backs now that we're working from our couches and our headaches and our, our the, the knots in the back of our necks and all the things that we've been feeling lately. Um, so Natalia Sikachowski uh, is uh, with Symmetry Physical Therapy. And of course, she's going to be talking about the word ergonomics that we've heard for a while now. And talking about how to, you know, make sure that your at-home station or your couch station or wherever you're working now um, is physically uh, more aligned for your body and things to watch for. So, Natalia. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Natalia Sikachowski. I am the owner of uh, and a physical therapist at Symmetry Physical Therapy in downtown Miami. So I'm a little further away from Boca, but now with everything virtual, I find that we're doing, you know, a lot of virtual work um, at the clinic. We'll treat all different types of patients. We see, you know, your young athletic population, um, people who are training for marathons and, you know, super active. We also see the everyday now, especially neck and back ache and people that are, when you said couch office, I was thinking, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I'll be, I'll be going through and talking about how you can set your home workstation up um, to the best of your ability to be body friendly. So a lot of the aches and pains that people are experiencing now from home just aren't necessary. You can make a few adjustments and, you know, elevate monitors and change your positioning and you don't have to have those tension headaches at the end of the day. So I'm going to be going into a little bit more of the ergonomics, um, going through a few different tips. You know, there's a big 25 point bullet sheet that we can go through. And I think Chastity sent over some exercises and stretches and stuff as well that people can do at home. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to getting everyone set up in body friendly positions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, okay, so we're going to go from, we have the physical, we have the professional development, we have the emotional, we have the, the, the mental. So I'm going to start with a question for all three of you, and we'll start with Dr. Cooper. Um, it'll be the same question, and it is based on your professional expertise. What is your opinion? Uh, what is the most common thing workers have gotten wrong as they transition to a home office? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, the biggest thing I think is that it is just, it's not the same as working in person. Um, it's probably not even the same as traditional remote work. Like even if you're already a remote worker, things are different now. Um, your kids are home, your spouse and your or your roommates are home. You might be taking care of sick family members. Um, and then all of your coworkers and your supervisors are trying to balance this as well. Um, no one should really be expected to proceed as if everything is normal. Um, but you do need to really put in that effort uh, to make sure that you are managing your mental health and your stress levels and that you're considering the limitations that your family and your colleagues are experiencing too. Um, this, is, this is really hard to do, especially if you're already like, feeling so overwhelmed with everything else that's going on. Uh, but the psychological research shows that with practice, you can get better at putting your health first and it can have really great co consequences for your work life down the road. Um, I'll talk about a few strategies later, but that's probably the biggest thing I've noticed that people have gotten wrong. It's just, it's just not the same and there's a lot of adjustments we need to make. Right, so just try not to, not to put a round peg in a square hole because it's just not, you know, accept that, I guess. Exactly. Awesome. All right, Dr. Sikachowski. I know I'm going to get it. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the biggest professional change, I think, from working in a regular office to working at home is uh, the fact that a lot of people don't create an office space for themselves. So we, you know, it reminds me, we had a raffle of like an ergonomic home station and the girl who won started uh, setting up the video and everything. And she said, my back and my neck are killing me. I said, well, let me see your setup. She actually had a tailgating lawn chair and a computer propped up on boxes. And she was working like this, <laughs> you know, and she said, 
I'm in so much pain all the time um, because we don't know how temporary this is. I think that a lot of us haven't taken the time to really truly set up a home office and a home workstation and make sure that you do have a proper ergonomic setup, that you have a supportive chair, that your monitor is at the correct height. And I think Sarah will be going into a little bit more detail of those self measurements with you know, our next questions. But um, I think that's one of the biggest changes from a physical standpoint is you know, you're not used to sitting all the time and not having all of those you know, office meetings and getting up and moving around. Um, so really making sure that you adapt to that and make sure that you keep your body moving and in a good position when you're not. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Julie. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I started thinking a lot and writing a lot about America's loneliness epidemic before COVID. Um, Cigna did a lot of research that, um, you know, technology, people were, people are less connected. You, you used to go out to restaurants before all this started and you'd see a family and four or five out of five people would all be on their phones or you'd see a bunch of girlfriends together or you know you'd go drive by a bus stop and high school kids all on their phones so now um when covid started we moved to a remote workforce where um, technology in in essence was the only way we could see each other without masks on and it was the way that we could transport ourselves into our parents homes see our siblings um, so the, but also people started getting really burned out, especially on Zoom calls. People started telling me from 7 a.m. To, to 8 p.m. their companies were setting up Zoom calls or Google Hangouts or other, you know, uh, Microsoft Teams. And I think that um, you, technology is here to stay. It's, it's giving us this type of access to come together as we are now, but people also need the opportunity to connect with each other and in a more meaningful way. And people, um, you know, going on to Zoom calls, we're seeing about 50% engagement rates. People are still doing their laundry. They're still full, you know, they're still um, multitasking. And so we've, uh, I'll talk later, come up with some strategies to help people create more meaningful human connection. And um, also it's gonna be important to create some boundaries around your workspace, some separation between work, you know, the day and the evening, um, being a mother versus a worker uh, and, and thinking through those different aspects of life. So I think technology is gonna be our solution and technology is gonna be our problem here with co in COVID. Wow. All right. Well, then let's go right into to that that and and so without you know your inter office connections and things like that, um, how should younger employees seek out mentorship and seek out those kinds of relationships? Yeah, I think that I mean any opportunity where we can learn from each other and help each other you're going to feel invigorated that the ability and um so i have a mentor um, i'm in uh, an entrepreneur's organization and we get together on zoom and we kind of have a formal model the model is that as a mentee i have specific goals on where i want to go and grow in my business measurable goals and we'll look at those and then we'll share challenges that i'm having so we kind of it's about an hour hour and 10 minute call you know challenges that i'm having and then my mentor will share from his or her experience how they handled challenges without telling me what to do but an experience share and from that i might glean some actually pivotal um, takeaways, One, my mentor Mitch actually connected me to a law firm on an issue. And when he understood that I was having a challenge, he said, Julie, if you wanna set up a second call this month, um, 
I want to make sure we have enough time to focus on your challenge. I felt like someone has my back. Someone cares about me, cares about my business, my business growth. And, we, and, and it's been wonderful that you know once or twice a month that you are getting together with someone where you can help each other with your professional trajectories. And it's also a conversation without face masks. Mm -hmm. So people who mentored at Sun Microsystems in their engineering department got promoted five times more than people who did not seek out mentors. Mentors who were willing to help other people got promoted six times more. Retention rates at the company were 20% higher with a cost savings of $6.4 million to Sun Microsystems before they were sold to Oracle. So there's a huge triple win and it does give people more human connection. So I think putting mentoring in your plan to both be a mentor and get a mentor, it's a pay it forward change. There's no better time than to do that than now, but have goals and have a standing meeting once or twice a month for 45 minutes, an hour, and um, you know, come to us if you need some mentor training. Um, we build within, like you'd have outsourced IT, we do outsourced mentoring. So it's just, it's a wonderful thing to have in your life, someone who's got your back and that you can share challenges with that maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing um, within your company or with other people. And do you, do you have more than one mentor? Do you have mentors for different? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think um, I subscribe to, um, so Mentor Mitch is my mentor for scaling my company. And then I have a mentor on being a badass woman executive hmm. um, named Edie and helping other women in business. Um, we work together on an initiative called the Women's Business Collaborative. Um, I have, um, you know, uh, my friend Marissa, uh, who I think is a, a, a spiritual mentor. So I do subscribe a little bit to having different mentors in one's life. And a lot of, and I have a lot of peer to peer mentoring relationships, um, where we can learn from each other, which I love. It's like such joy to get on a zoom call with a girlfriend slash mentor or a great guy slash mentor. And just having that time, it's something that that's one of the highlights of my week is having that time with someone where we can really talk honestly. And it's a, it's a, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas conversation mm -hmm. with trust. And, um, we know we can do it again. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you. All right, Natalia, this is, uh, this is your, you're going to give us all the answers on how we can feel great right now. Are there certain types of equipment or technology to help make a workspace as ergonomic as possible? And I guess it doesn't mean the magazines that are holding my, my screen up. There are tons of toys that you can buy to make a home office completely ergonomic. Um, there is a lot of equipment out there. A lot of it you know, does the same thing. But the first step in knowing how your workspace should be set up is arranging your workspace to your body. So I'll go through and, you know, for everyone out there at home, don't feel like you need to be adjusting things right now while I'm talking. I'm glad we're recording um, so that you can go back and, you know, take a look. But um, making sure that your feet are flat on the ground. So, you know, if you're a little bit shorter, there's lifts that you can, you know, purchase of different sizes to have your feet flat on the ground and supported. You definitely don't want your feet hanging. It puts a lot of distraction force on your knee. You might have icky, you know, knee pains. It can also compress the nerves in the back of the knee if your legs are pressed up against the back of the chair. So you want to make sure that you have a fist width distance between your knee and the back of the chair when you're sitting. You want to have your back supported, so you need to scoop back enough on the chair that your back is flat against the surface. They have uh, lumbar support rolls. I mean, at home, you can do like a, a makeshift and take a towel roll and roll it up and stick it behind your back, but 
they actually have nice fitted pads that have straps that go around your office chair or your kitchen table chair, which I hope you're not using, but if you are, you can at least adapt it. Um, you want to make sure that your knees are at the same level of your hips. So you definitely don't want your knees higher than your hips. It puts a lot of pressure on the hip joint. You want to make sure that your elbows are at the same level of your keyboard at about a 90 degree angle. So your elbows are going to be right next to your side, 90 degree angle to the keyboard, nice ergonomic mouse and keyboard if you can. Uh, again, Amazon is like your best friend out there for this. And then one of the, the biggest things is making sure that your monitor height is correct. So at home, there's two things that you want to look at. The first is you want your monitor to be about an arm's length distance from you. So right now, you know, my monitor is a little bit further away, but if you stick your arm out, you should hit the touch of your monitor, uh, the tip of your monitor. So oftentimes, uh, people will have their monitors further away, and over time, they end up leaning forward into their monitor, and then you get all those nice neck aches by the end of the day, and your tension headaches and things like that. Um, the other thing is make sure that your eyes are centered in the middle, uh, middle third of your monitor screen. So if you take about one third of the way down and you look straight forward, it should be in the middle of the monitor. You, if you have two screens, depending on how much time you spend on those screens, if it's about a 70-30 split, you want to have your main screen directly in front of you. If it's more of a true 60-40 or 50-50, you want to have the monitor meet directly in front of you. So you have one on the right and one on the left. Make sure you don't have any space between them. One of the worst things for your eyes is that if you have a little gap between your monitors, you might not realize it, but it puts a lot of extra eye strain um, and can cause a lot of additional fatigue because your, your mind is trying to figure out, okay, are you looking at something close to you or are you looking at something a little bit further away? So those are all adjustments that you can make at home. Um, on the link that Chastity sent out, we do have you know, a bunch of equipment that we personally use in clinic and recommend to patients, so you're welcome to you know, shop around on like the Amazon ergonomic store, but things are very similar. So you know, the most important thing is to make sure that your body is aligned and set up correctly for your workspace. I, I wish that I could see everybody on this call right now, because I guarantee we would have seen that, you know, that and checking how if there's a space between your knees and but I mean, that's very valuable information. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure. All right. Now, Bill, now how can employers or managers or leaders within their organization keep morale high without the, the social interaction that we have, the personal interaction that we've got going on? Yeah, so there is actually a lot of research on this. Um, it's not necessarily related to the COVID pandemic, but um, definitely a lot about keeping morale high um, during times of organizational stress. Um, and my boss is actually a perfect example of this. So if you ever need someone to follow, I, I would suggest talking to him, Dr. Good, the Dean of the College of Business. Um, but anyway, the, the first, one of the biggest things that we can do is, is really empower our employees and support them in terms of uh, their own well-being. Um, so this means creating opportunities for employees to connect um, and reflect uh, uh, together. Um, and that'll help them have that sense of, of community that like Julie's talking about that and, and a shared sense of purpose. Um, but it also means like checking in on them individually and showing that you care as a leader about their development in the workplace. Um, communication both ways is key. Um, here, making sure you're checking in on them, um, making sure that you're updating them every chance you get and being really transparent with them. Um, and flexibility and understanding is, is going to be huge right now. Um, people are dealing with a lot. Uh, you know, just, just like Julia said, this loneliness epidemic is happening and it's even worse now. Mental health epidemic is happening and it's even worse now. Um, just make sure you're mindful of the things that are going on with employees' personal lives. Um, so, you know, flexibility and scheduling, having 
a backup in case a virtual meeting it inevitably isn't isn't working out. Um, even like rearranging teams so that uh, it, rearranging teams, like even if, if you put people who aren't experts in the individual fields on different teams, that really cultivates diversity and creativity. Um, and then I would say also just recognizing your employees. Um, so recognizing accomplishments of individuals so that everybody feels seen. Um, recognizing important milestones, uh, even, if, even if it's just like birthdays or anniversaries um, and milestones for the organization um, because that helps make that, that economic situation not look so dire. Um, it's basically, it's just important that employees are reminded that there's still good things happening and that you still care as a leader. So let me go stay with you then for a moment. Um, the, you know, the, the last speaker we had on our uh, for polls, I believe it was the last speaker, he had said that what he does is, is has a Zoom, an open Zoom meeting. And then his colleagues uh, and the people he manages can just jump in all day to this Zoom meeting. Um, almost like you're an open door policy, but now we have to go virtually. Um, so, I mean, is that, is that a, a great, is that, you know, I mean, it, it sounds like we could connect with each other now that we're virtual at all hours, right? So how do we disconnect when it's <laughs> time to disconnect? Because, you know, when you're working from home and you have that one thing you have to do that comes in at eight o'clock at night, you're like, oh, I'll just do it. So give us some tips on disconnecting maybe and, and stepping away. Yeah, so I mean the open door policy is amazing like that's that's so impressive that somebody can do that and that they're available to their employees at all times. But yes, that, that can be very risky uh, for people because that that can be super overwhelming if you're always available and, and always going to be doing work. Um, and particularly I'm seeing in my, my research on this pandemic study that um, people who are who score higher on a trait that we call conscientiousness, um, which conscientiousness means you're really hardworking, you really enjoy working, you're always trying to get stuff done, you're super reliable and dependable. Um, and that's, that's usually a good trait for, uh, for employers, they're usually looking for that, you know, that's usually something that you want in an employee. Um, but we're finding in our research that these people are, are having a really hard time separating that work-life boundary. I am one of them. Sometimes my husband has to remind me that it's that to eat dinner. Um, but, you know, you finding those boundaries, and, and Julie talked about it a little bit too, um, even setting up physical boundaries. So only having one space for work. It's tempting to go sit on the patio or sit on the bed uh, <laughs> to go work, but uh, you really want to be able to delineate the work life from the leisure life. Um, talking to your to your roommates or your, your family members or your spouse uh, and really setting up that schedule of, okay, this is going to be my time to work. This is going to be my time for child care or pet care or leisure time, whatever. Um, so it, it, it's really, yeah, so there, it's really about that balance of making sure you you find a schedule a space and a mental space uh, to be able to disconnect either from work or disconnect from play to be able to work. Um, so sometimes it does help to set up those, those physical boundaries, setting an alarm on your phone, scheduling in planned exercise or cooking or playing with your pets, um, and then practicing mindfulness or meditation. There's a couple of great apps for mindfulness and meditation, and it is so helpful to getting your brain to focus and, and just throw out all of those other thoughts that are bothering you. Um, I really like the apps. There's one app called My Life and there's one app called Headspace. I would really recommend those if you want to try it, if you're really just dipping your toes in mindfulness or meditation. Did that answer your question, Sarah? Absolutely. And then, and then we got some, some apps to go with it, which is perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So let's go back to Julie now. Um, you had mentioned something about, about, you know, now we're at home with not just ourselves and work, but kids and spouses and, and siblings or, or, or whoever. Um, so what are, you know, some, how are some ways that parents can keep their children focused while staying, uh, you know, focused themselves at work? 
you know, we're all in one house, school starting virtually, uh, you know, so what does that look like? I know a lot of people on this call have very young kids, including our incoming chair. Uh, he's got the cutest, cutest little ones. But how are you working and, and keeping, keeping everything rolling? Yeah, no, it's, a, we really, um, you know, being a parent during this pandemic, um, I learned today from Network for Executive Women that 60% of all families do not have childcare. So you could be on executive calls, on Zoom calls, and having kids running around you, wanting to play, wanting your attention, and you don't have childcare, and you're trying to kind of divvy up with yourself and your partner or spouse or as a single mother and or father and um you know a lot of you we're seeing a lot of migrations of people moving out to the suburbs setting up more space i was on a call with a guy in california the other day and he insulated his garage so he could get some space from his three kids and be able to work <laughs> so um you know it's very challenging and i remember um you know i think having a community of support um, is gonna be really important. People going through similar things. Um, and I, I remember um, I was taught, we were doing a flash mentoring session, which is kind of like speed dating. And a woman joined the call and she's like, I am taking care of my team. I think back to what Dr. Bell said of that, of that conscientious person. I've got a team, I've got you know two kids, husband i'm like trying to hold it all together and i can't i am falling apart and i just need to let my hair down and talk with people so she was very happy that we took the zoom call into one-on-one -on -one conversations about resiliency about how we are managing with the people around us we talked you know and, and that ability for her to resonate with other mothers and parents and share strategies with each other. You know, for me, I just sort of look at, you know, I'll say one thing I'm lucky, my daughter is uh, gonna be a senior in high school. So if anything, I'm trying to get her to come and have dinner with us, mm -hmm. or I'm worried about depression and, and, you know, getting online for classes in a couple weeks. Um, her running out with her friends and coming back with COVID. We have, diff I have different concerns. Um, but I think when I look, like yesterday, she came home, she had a fight with her boyfriend <laughs> and she came home and we made pumpkin spice, um, gluten-free um, uh, cookies together and we had a cup of tea. And I just took that time out of my schedule and so we could spend time together. But I think for me, I, and I'm very much can relate to that conscientious person who's gonna burn themselves out, because I'm like that. Um, I think about eight Fs, eight Fs. The first is family. The second is friends. The third, in no order, is function, how we function. Um, and I'd add focus to that. Uh, finance, fitness, um, food, <laughs> it's very important right now, fun and free and, and freedom. And so for me, I get very, um, stressed. I'll be really focused. Um, I said, I used a technology called mix max. So I just send people the link they schedule with me and I made it so that they can only schedule between 10 and four. So I'll have calls all day, but I know at four o'clock, um, I can, if I don't have a client engagement, I'm going to go and take a swim and that's going to be, or it might be six o'clock, but that is going to be the in-between of my work day. And I'm going to get some of that stress and that energy off. I'm going to exercise in the pool and then I'm going to be better as a person, as a family member, you know, when I get back in, um, we got my mom a, a Facebook portal so that we can have, um, that's a longer story, but we have dinners now together. She has not left her apartment in Miami and I haven't seen her in five months. And so we have dinner parties together. Um, and they, like with this really cool technology, the 
the lens follows you all around. You could be walking 180 degrees and the lens follows and zooms in on you and zooms out. It's just really um, neat. Um, so those are just some thoughts is that we are juggling a lot. Um, companies need to be very respectful of that people might have a kid running in the background or a dog barking. And how do we make fun of that? One group had a scavenger hunt and you had to bring a kid or an animal like to the to the zoom screen before we started the call you had to like bring your kid or, you know welcoming that making making that part of the joy of seeing into each other's homes that's awesome great great ideas and and it's true i mean we've all the very last thing you said seeing into each other's homes seeing into each other's you know personal lives and seeing the dog that that they've talked about for the last two years at work and seeing that dog or, and meeting like Jordan's Jordan's son the, the last time we had a meeting and he popped up on the screen. It's just, um, there's a lot of positives that have come out of this. And as a mother of 20 year old and 18 year old baking cookies, how special was that, right? Like you said, you're trying to get them to, to spend time with you. So very special. Uh, okay, so let's get to the physical. Uh, there was this great question what, and, and this is for you, Natalia, what should the typical work day look like? Like the time spent sitting, moving, you know, looking at a computer screen. Is there some kind of schematic when it comes to that? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a great question. I mean, there's also, we have to talk about what the ideal is and then what's realistic because we can go through a virtual setup and I can tell you all the different angles that everything should be at. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're with your legs crisscrossed on the chair, hunched forward, you know, that's going to happen sometimes. And that's okay. You're getting your body into different positions. It's just spending the majority of the time in a proper setup. So ideally, every hour, you want to get up, you want to walk around, you want to move for 10 minutes, especially right before and after lunch. That goes a little bit less into the physical joint health, but more into like your gut health. You want to be moving right before and right after you eat. So if people typically go out for lunch, you know, or go on a walk after lunch. You want to keep that in your routine. Um, every hour as well, you'd like to take a break from staring at your monitor and try and look at the furthest thing away from you that you can see. You want to kind of imagine a dice and those five points on a dice. Try and keep your head straight and move your eyes to each of those five points on that dice and spend 10 seconds there and really try and look. I'm not talking about like if you're in your living room, you know, looking across the the room at the picture on the wall. Try and look outside of a window and really challenge your eyesight to focus on those things that are further away from you. One of the things that we're seeing a lot of is with everyone on their screen so close, people are you know, needing glasses sooner and having more eye problems because you're not challenging yourself to look at those um, far distance items. So you definitely wanna make sure that you're doing that. Um, and you want to make sure, I mean, move as much as possible. Our bodies were made to move. We were made to get up, walk around, even if you're stuck at a desk. You know, you can do plenty of exercises and stretches, a, a few things that Chastity had linked to. They're sitting stretches. We did a whole sitting office series on our Instagram where you don't even need to get up, but we show you how to stretch your hamstrings, how to stretch your glutes out, how to do different neck stretches, back activations to make sure that at least you're still getting blood flow. So if you're just sitting and you're stagnant, you're not getting that oxygen circulating, your joints aren't getting you know, lubricated because you're not moving them. So you wanna make sure if you have to be sitting that you're still you know, squeezing your shoulder blades down and back, keeping your shoulders away from your ears every hour, do 10 of them. You know? And if you add that into your routine, it's about building practice makes habit, right? So if you have all these different things that you're trying to do throughout the day, even if you hit 70% of them, you're still in a much better position than if you're just you know, sitting at your desk all day and not getting up. So take the time, set a reminder, or every time you fill your water or go to the bathroom, you know, build it into your routine that you're, you're up and you're active and you're moving. Great. And so I, do you have one of those big balls that you sit on? <laughs> so, that's a great question. Um, I'm glad you brought it up. So one of those big physio balls, in theory, it's a good idea. 
because people think, oh, if I get this unstable surface that I sit on, I'm gonna sit nice and upright and I'm gonna work on my balance and activate my muscles. But actually what ends up happening is people get those big physio balls and then they roll on them and they end up sitting like this. Um, and you know, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. So because of my profession and uh, because I just love movement, I actually have a really crazy desk set up at home and at the office. I have a full um, two monitors and then a full sit to stand desk. And I went one step further and I actually got a folding treadmill and I put it under my desk. <laughs> I thought I was so, about to say that, but then I thought, there's no way. Yeah, wow. um, it's called a walking pad, and it's, uh, you know, linked to, to our, our store, but it's, it's wonderful, because it's not like you're, you know, walking super fast. Even if you're walking at two miles an hour, you're still able to concentrate, type, look at your monitor, and you're getting those steps in. You're, you're getting a little bit of movement in. Um, so if you want to, you know, if you want to go super extreme, I would recommend a sit to stand desk and that folding treadmill. Well, anyone that knows me knows I'd be doing it with my heels on and you'd probably yeah. not be okay with that. So <laughs> well, it comes with other issues. <laughs> exactly. All right. So before I do have one more question, but we only have about 10 more minutes. So I wanted to give the uh, group here, you know, everyone listening, the opportunity to type a question in the Q&A box. So if you guys scroll down, everyone that, that's in the webinar right now scrolls down on your screen, down in the middle bottom, there's a Q&A box. Uh, you can type a question in there and I will keep an eye on that. Uh, and so while, while we're gonna wait for some questions, I will ask, I'm gonna ask you all the same question. Um, and we'll start with Bell. Um, and that is, what has been your biggest professional change or you know, positive thing that you've learned uh, over the last four or five months since this whole you know pandemic happened. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, so much. There's just so much change going on right now. Um, the one, the biggest change for me that I that I I've probably already talked about is that transition to. Uh, work always being there and just reminding myself that I have to disconnect and uh, that I really have to take time for myself and to spend time with my family. Uh, that's been that's been the biggest thing for me. Um, for for people who are, um, uh, are you know, I'll talk about a different personality trait here: uh, extroverted versus introverted. Um, you know, let me, I'll define those first. You know, you, you, they're not just categories. You're neither, an, you're not just an extrovert or just an introvert. There's, there's this big scale that goes in between. You can land anywhere on there. Um, at the extreme, extroverts are really social. They really like, you know, going to parties and going out with friends and dominating a conversation, that sort of thing. On the other end, we have introverts who are shy. They really, like, it takes a lot of energy out of them to be social, um, you know, they don't, they don't really like being around people a lot. Um, I fall more towards that introvert end. Uh, so the biggest thing that uh, we have to remember is that um, everybody on this scale is so different and how they're going to manage uh, working from home and not being around people all the time, it, it's going to be different for different people. Um, so in my study, I'm seeing that, you know, extroverts, Extroverts are doing okay. They're still finding ways to connect. Um, if you want to figure out where you land on that scale, you can contact me. I'll happily send you some, uh, you know, little quizzes. You can try to figure out where you land on there. Um, but you know, everyone is struggling. Every, all of us are struggling, no matter what person our personality is. Um, but extroverts are having a hard time because they're used to being able to go out to the bar and catch up with colleagues and friends and now they're really restricted in what they can do um, but they don't seem to have problems reaching out to friends and family introverts like me <laughs> we're having we're having a hard time if you have an introverted friend check in on them because they're probably struggling right now um, it's not natural for introverts to reach out to people and you know say hey let's let's have a zoom chat or let's get on this this 
virtual game or whatever. It's not natural for us to do that. Um, but we're still, but introverts are still feeling that isolation. Um, they're still feeling that loneliness um, and, and they're probably struggling. Um, so if you happen to fall towards that end, um, what I've learned is, you know, you have to make a schedule for actually allowing social connection in your life. So maybe setting a weekly time to get on the portal and to like, like Julie was talking about and chat with family, um, actively trying to engage in meetings. Um, if you're too overwhelmed by the, the big crowd and the big Zoom meeting or the big Chime meeting or whatever it is, um, try to connect with just a few team members at a time and, and, you know, come up with some like, uh, uh, prepared questions just in case you're worried about feeling awkward about what not to what what to say to people um and just try to stay positive when you're interacting with people don't don't feel embarrassed like people are probably going to forget what you say anyway <laughs> later on but um you do even if even if usually you're not really interested in being around a lot of people you still need that social connection that still needs to be part of our lives so um there's still ways to do that virtually um so I think that's the biggest thing that I'm, I'm learning through, through research and through experience is that we, everybody needs that social connection. Well, thank you very much. All right, Natalia, why don't you share what you've learned, biggest professional change that you've seen? Um, the biggest professional change has been from going into a profession that's really manual, really hands-on, active, up, moving, guiding and exercises, you know, doing joint mobilizations, uh, when right now we're still working in office and virtually, but for about a month and a half, we were just doing virtual physical therapy. So it was a huge shift from someone who, you know, likes to be up and active to now I'm, I'm talking through a computer screen to patients and I'm, you know, queuing and having to change angles and making sure that people feel comfortable with all of their equipment that they have, or if they don't have very much equipment. Um, also, empowering people to feel comfortable moving on their own, you know, and I think that in the grand scheme of things, being able to do virtual physical therapy is an enormous benefit because you can connect with people all over and you can help people all over, but it was definitely a really big shift to go to, you know, not being in person and three-dimensional with someone and, you know, having to really focus on making sure that people are still getting the right activations and movements and exercises. Um, and then, you know, just for our team, we have a really close-knit, you know, group of seven and going from seeing each other pretty much every day, like everyone, to being more virtual, you know, having those meetings, having those check-ins and making sure that we're all you know, still feeling supported and giving, giving our opinions and having an open space that we can talk and discuss, whether it be, you know, case studies and patients, or just checking in and saying, you know, how are things going? <laughs> what can we do to help? So yeah, big, big change. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and Bell, I meant to ask, um, you guys are starting school. Students are coming back to school now, right? They're coming back on campus and school starts 24th? Yeah, we'll see everybody bright and early next week. Very cool. Very cool. Penn University has a lot of safety precautions in place for coronavirus. So, um, you know, they've, they've done an excellent job preparing the, cam the campus so that students can come back and, and faculty and, and staff can feel safe as well. Yeah, I, I've heard some of the, the um, procedures that have been implemented and, and there's so much space that you guys can have this. You already had smaller classrooms or class sizes. So, you know, I've heard great things about how Lynn has moved forward through all this. So, uh, all right, Miss Julie. Yeah, well, when, as soon as COVID started, we realized, you know, 80, 90 percent of the workforce was going to be working remotely. So my team and I got together and we stood up um, an experience called Remote Not Isolated Flash Mentoring. And we decided, you know, almost regardless of whether we make any money, we'll just do this. We're just going to invite executives, bring them together and hold the space for people to focus on themes like resiliency, finding your North Star, um, 
how, you know, what's your ETA, empathy, transparency, and accountability? How are you flexing your leadership muscle, inclusion mentoring? And we started doing these speed sessions and um, we did, we'd run like 40 of them. And when one association brought us in, a week later, Costco hired us to bring them in-house there. So um, one of the questions that I want to sort of pose to you is, it's part of our finding your North Star, but if you could meet yourself, like Sarah and Natalia, if you could meet yourself, and it's now January 1st, 2021. Today is now January 1st, 2021, and you're meeting your future self. What advice does she or he have for you about how you are going to spend the next several months of your life? Your future self is, you know, has some thoughts on you and your leadership and impact you can make and your role with your family and kids and work and relationships and your own mental health and sanity, what advice would we have for ourselves? Hmm. You know, it's just an interesting reflection and we get people talking about things like that. And for us, we decided to get out and start putting groceries into people's cars through an amazing organization called Hel Hospitality Helping Hands. Mm -hmm. They're feeding um, every week um, right in this area, filling thousands and thousands of cars. You wear a face mask and you put the groceries into cars and the, the, the cars are just, you know, thousands of them with little kids and dogs and BMWs and Mercedes of people that don't have food. And so for me, it's like, I need to take a stand for doing some volunteer work. I'm able-bodied, I'm gonna get out there and my husband and I now do that together. So that in, in three months, four months, I'm going to be glad I did that. And then what else can I be doing? Yeah, we, we have more time now in some ways. So what what is on your list that you can now do? And do it. Get up. Get up every hour for 10 minutes. I, I was taking notes. Okay. I'm, so, I'm on a standing desk in heels. Just to, Are you? Ooh, in heels. Yeah, standing desk and heels. <laughs> um, okay, I have two questions that came in and we have very little time. So it's going to be like this power answer, quick, you know, whatever, uh, 30 second thing. So the first question, and it's for all of you or any of you, any recommendations on helping those who work for you without micromanaging them? Dr. Bell or Dr. Cooper. Yeah, so yeah, this, this is probably in my realm here. Um, so uh, it's so tempting to, when you uh, you see somebody doing something wrong in your opinion and you really want to tell them what to do. Um, instead of just telling people what to do or trying, like you said, micromanaging um, uh, without hearing their whole story, just sit down with them, ask them what's going on, why, why is it happening this way? And then, you know, listen and then ask if, they want advice do and usually people say yes if you say hey can i give can i would you like to hear what i think you know people usually say yes and that's when you can start to open that door to um helping them you know do things the right way in your in your mind um doing your best to empower employees so um you know a way to, a way to help do that is is putting them in charge of things if they if they want to if they have the time um giving them agency like putting them in charge of a project or a team um and then letting people work on their own time you know this is we're virtual we can we can work any, at any time um does it have to be done right now is the question um if you, you know if they get it done be satisfied with them getting it done that's a huge accomplishment in this pandemic era right now um if you notice that work is lacking that's when you want to kind of open that conversation about hey you need to you need to start getting specifics here hope that helps Definitely. Anybody else want to chime in? All right. So last question. Uh, can you talk about working from home and wardrobe? Is there a mental advantage to actually dressing for work when it's easier to just put on a t-shirt and shorts or heels or no heels, flip-flops? You tell us. It helps me psychologically um, when I have, you know, I obviously I do a lot. Everything I do, I do mentor training and these Zoom calls, so I'm with people every day. 
Um, so a lot of times I'll wear like um, yoga pants, but I bought, I, I bought blazers. So I'll like have a t-shirt and I'll throw a blazer on. But sometimes I, I am willing myself to dress up a little bit more um, to, because it affects my brain psychologically to feel like a professional, especially if I have meetings that I'm looking forward to. When I'm all schlubby, I just want to lie down and watch, you know, Outlanders on Netflix. Hmm. It's a good show. <laughs> Either, anybody else want to comment on that? I'll defer to Dr. Cooper because I work in uh, leggings and dry fit shirts. So I'm pretty lucky when I go to work, it's about the same thing at home. <laughs> Yeah, there, I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot of research on this, um, but I'll say just from personal experience, um, I I've made it like a whole month without doing laundry because I'm basically wearing the same pajama bottoms every day when I go to work. Um, but it does feel good. So if if I'm not on Zoom meetings, well, um, it does feel good to just sit in my pajamas and work all day. But if I'm on Zoom meetings, it also feels really empowering to actually put on the makeup and do the hair and, and say, okay, I, hey, I look good today. You know, and <laughs> that makes me feel a little more presentable and feel a little more confident in, in meetings. So I really think it's just up to the person, what, what feels comfortable, what, what helps you get the most work done and, and feel good about yourself. Well, ladies, thank you very, very much for taking the time to talk to us today. I know that we are we froze? Am I frozen? No. Okay. Sorry, my, my screen froze for a moment. Uh, I know that we did record this because, and which is great because we can now share it with others, uh, and that we will be sending out if we haven't yet uh, the the tips on you know what to do physically, and maybe we can get the introvert extrovert uh, information, the test to see which one you are as well, and share that. And Julie, maybe we can get a little bit of information about the power mentoring that you had brought up. Um, but I mean, this again was just a fabulous presentation. I appreciate all of your time and I appreciate everyone attending today as well. So thank you. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for thank having you. us. Bye.